Okay, um, good evening, everyone. This is another TCAS talk. Um, to the second of the third series, TCAS talks. Um, tonight we have Laura Mucci. She is a um, experimental archaeologist and researcher. Um, she's going to be showing her sort of her master's research on Gebroic pottery and generally just more Cornish Iron Age and Bronze Age pottery. Is that is that, uh, is that a fair? Um, I mean, I'm only going to be looking at the early Bronze Age. So uh, if you came for the Iron Age, you will be sorely disappointed. Um, but yes, the rest of that is, is true. Cool. Okay, brilliant. Okay, uh, screen sharing. Here we go. So yeah, hello everyone. Um, my name is Laura Miucci. Uh, I'm sort of, I do a lot of different various things. Um, but sort of for this specifically, I'm an archaeologist, I'm a researcher, and I kind of dabble in experimental archaeology in my very limited uh, free time. Um, I'm currently working on as an on-site archaeologist in Dublin, Ireland, on St Mary's Abbey, if any of you have heard of it. It is the kind of biggest Norman to medieval um, sort of abbey and hub of Christianity in Ireland. Um, and I'm doing post-excavation work for Cornwall Council, so I kind of dip in and out. Um, I'm originally from Cornwall myself. In 2021, I completed my Master's of Science degree in Experimental Archaeology and Material Culture. That was at UCD, so University College Dublin. Um, and before that, I did a Bachelor of Arts Joint Honours degree in French and History with a minor in Classics and Archaeology, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, at the University of Kent. Uh, next slide, please, Ryan. Um, so just most people probably know what Trevisca ware is, I'm not going to talk about it too much, but um, Trevisca ware was a regional pottery type and an integral part of the material culture of the late Neolithic to the late Bronze Age periods in Cornwall. Uh, Trevisca ware is characterised by its usage of gabroic clay, which is sourced from the Lizard Peninsula. Uh, this gabroic clay was extensively exploited for crafting ceramics within the Cornwall area, particularly during prehistory, although we do see it in the succeeding periods, but there seems to have been a bit of a decline in its usage. Um, so, for example, we find ceramic finds using uh, gabroic clay to at least some degree, so usually gabroic admixtures ad later on. Um, they've been found sort of dating from the late Neolithic right up to the Romano-British period. Um, gabroic clay derives from degraded gabbro, so that's your sort of coarse-grained, mafic, intrusive igneous rock, which, according to Wikipedia, constitutes much of the Earth's oceanic crust. Um, it sort of formed at mid-ocean ridges and sort of comes up to the surface sometimes. And that's sort of what we see at the, at the lizard. You can see kind of on the map here, the lizard is this sort of bit in pink. Um, and sort of the gabroic clay deposits along the lizard are thought to comprise the majority of gabroic clay in Britain, both sort of from pre prehistory right up until sort of modern day. Um, you've probably all heard of Henrietta Quinnell, um, but if you haven't, she sort of talks a lot about Trevisca ware. So if you want to kind of learn more about it in a bit more detail, you can kind of check out some works oh, by her. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, next slide, please. I'm trying not to talk a lot about archaeological theory, so I'm going to try and be as quick as possible. Um, so the following concepts, we've got your object biography and your experiential and experimental archaeology. Um, these concepts are sort of the main players in my master's thesis and sort of the following definitions are my own. And, you know, don't take these as like the be all and end all. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, um, so object biography is a methodology that surpasses simple provenance research into an object. And it looks to explore an object through each stage in its life cycle, when no stage in the life cycle is prioritized over another. And sort of the relationships involving the object in each stage of its life cycle are examined, such as the relationships between tr a, a Trevisca ware vessel, its decoration, the motivations of a potter, uh, this sort of thing. Um, so this methodology is kind of most fruitful when it's applied in the most interdisciplinary way possible. It's important to remember that these relationships involving the chosen material culture can also change over time. Um, so what might be true in the early Bronze Age, for example, isn't necessarily true in the Iron Age. Um, so then experimental archaeology is a concept pioneered by John Coles in the 1970s. He actually uh, died quite recently. But he was a pretty uh, prolific writer in the field. Um, and it's sort of been growing in popularity ever since. It's a concept by which it, everyone that kind of adheres to it attempts to explain and understand prehistoric mater material culture through the means of testing hypotheses. And the, 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 the 
pardon. The hypotheses are driven by the archaeology itself and the results are then used to further conversations on the material culture in question. So for example, and this is sort of the umbrella purpose of my ongoing research, you could explore the properties of gabroic clay to see why its usage was so popular in the early Bronze Age in Cornwall. And actually, when you test these hypotheses, if they are later proven untrue, that can actually be as equally important to the current state of knowledge as those which are, quote unquote, successful. Um, which brings me on to the experimental archaeology, sorry, experiential archaeology, which I kind of believe goes hand in hand with the experimental. Uh, the experiential is a relatively recent standalone concept, which is kind of fast gaining traction. In earlier years, it was seen by some sort of just playing uh, and sort of offered little to no valid contributions to the field of experimental archaeology. However, I would say that the experiential is both a valid and crucial component of experimental archaeology because it attempts to the best of its ability to simulate past processes in a very hands-on approach, such as the outdoor actualistic firing of a replica Travisca ware vessel. Like by doing so, one can really understand the archaeology they are studying in a much more holistic manner. Um, for more discussions on object biography, see works including those by Tringham 1994, Gell 1998, Hoskins 1998, and Schamberger et al. 2008. Um, for more discussion on experimental archaeology, see works including those by Cole, Cole's 1966, 1973, 1979, this is sort of the kind of beginning of it, uh, Reynolds 1999, Callahan 1999, Herkham 2005, and Graves Brown uh, 2015. These are kind of key uh, texts. Um, and there exists sort of, you know, some contention as to whether experimental ar archaeology should be strictly experiments or expanded to include the experiential too. Um, so I kind of I've tried to suggest varying um, reading lists throughout this lecture that kind of talk about different viewpoints. Um, so, yeah, next slide, please, Brian. <laughs> um, so if you're sitting there thinking that perhaps you're a little, you know, kind of overwhelmed by all the theory talk, I really want to recommend this book. Now, I don't know anyone who wrote this book, um, but I just think it's great. It's uh, Archaeological Theory in the New Millennium, and it basically summarizes all of the diverse archaeological theories that have come out in the 21st century. Oh, um, great. And they try to do it in as an objective a way as, possi as possible. And quote unquote, the quote on the back says they attempt to chart the changing world of archaeological theory. Um, so it has it basically talks about each theory and gives you loads of recommended readings for each theory. Um, so I sort of use it as a springboard anytime I kind of want to write a paper or do any research. Um, yeah. And yeah, that brings us on to the next slide, please. Any questions about the sort of theory stuff? I'm trying to make it a bit more interactive. So we only kind of, we do questions at the end of each sort of um, section of the, the presentation. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to ask anything. Um... Very quickly, please, please repeat. I just got online. I'd miss the name of that book, please. Oh, yes. Um, we it's, if we can go back to the slide, that actually might be easier, if that's all right, uh, Ryan. All right. <laughs> um, so, it's it's archaeological. The next one. Yeah, the one we've just done. Yeah, it's archaeological theory in the new millennium. I put a, I wanted to put a photo on the presentation. So anyone who's very visual like myself, this is what it looks like. Cool. Uh, was that is is that uh, the answer you're happy with, Nigel? Yeah. Uh, any other questions on kind of any of the theory stuff? All right, to move on. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's just move on. All <laughs> they right, they cool. missed their time. <laughs> um, There'll be more so, opportunities. <laughs> um, so right, this is go. getting into the object biography um, section of the talk. Um, so selecting the data set. So this was the data set I used for my master's thesis. Um, the starting point for selecting the data set was Andy M. Jones's, uh, you might have heard of him, Cornwall Archaeological Unit. He's sort of written a lot of stuff very extensively on Cornwall. Um, his PhD thesis on Bronze Age ceremonial landscapes, which was published as a monograph in 2005. And it contained appendices of different variables. So appendix one was um, excavated barrows up until 2005. Um, and I, cr I first started off by cross-referencing cross that with Appendix 2, which is barrows containing pottery. And I also looked at Appendix 8, which is barrows containing cremated human bone. And then two lists were made, one of the excavated barrows that contained pottery and one of the excavated barrows containing cremated human bone. And obviously um, any sites that were in both of those lists were obviously like my favourites. Um, 
and then with the help of Hannah at the Her Records Office, so Historic England Records Office, and Kim at Crescent Kerno, uh, the archives, um, sort of any excavation reports, newspaper articles, literally anything I could find that talked about the sites on these lists were researched. Um, between the three of us, we managed to actually find reports for almost all of the sites on the two lists. I think there was about two sites that we couldn't find anything for. Um, so any sites that were poorly reported were then eliminated from the potential data set. So for example, um, you got like some sites would have three or four different reports. Another site would have three lines in the West Britain newspaper, you know, so um, that kind of stuff kind of got omitted because I just couldn't really use it. Um, and then anything that could be read online was read online. And I sourced that from kind of varying websites. You know how you get signed up to everything when you're a student. So like academia, research gate, all those kind of things. Um, some of them were given to me directly from the Her Records office and some cases contacting the researchers directly. So um, there's actually a PhD thesis I refer to on a lipid, a lipid analysis. And yeah, that I got direct from the researcher. Um, and then sort of any reports that were only in physical format um, were read over several days at Crescent Kerno. Uh, the list of sites that kind of had at least adequate reporting were sent to Royal Cornwall Museum, uh, where Jenny, the archaeological collections manager, she would look at the database um, to see if any of those bronze age ceramics were in their collections. And um, there were quite a lot from the list that were in their collections, but there was a few that weren't. Um, so basically any early Bronze Age ceramics that came from sites that had relatively good literature I looked at. Um, so then I ended up having a primary data set. So you see I've got uh, three beakers, 15 Trevisco air vessels and five food uh, vessels. And um, then I had a pretty big secondary data set as well, actually. And then in late May, early June, I visited the Royal Corn Museum and I spent three intense weeks examining all of the ceramics in person, you know, making written notes, taking photos, um, doing some drawings. And I was even able on days when closed to the public to examine some of the ones in, you know, that big display case, just as you walk into the museum, I got to look at those as well and handle them and kind of um, see how they felt and make notes and things. And then I ended up spending, I spent three days at the Lizard where uh, Angie, who's actually here tonight, um, she helped me um, source some gabbroic clay from the lizard and I then uh, did most of the processing of that in Cornwall um, and then I returned to UCD so sort of I did the kind of experimental part of the project was during June and early July so that's just a little brief what I did. <laughs> um, next slide please. Um, so the object uh, stages implemented within the object biography structure. Um, while it can be difficult to differentiate between the Chanel Paratois approach and the object biographic approach, to my knowledge, we'll both examine an object at various stages throughout its life cycle. The former tends to discuss agency flowing one way, looking at how humans have shaped the material world around them. Um, and it particularly focuses on the processes of creating an object in a more kind of general schema. So like how to make an, generally an early medieval uh, penannual brooch or, or something like this, um, while the latter considers agency as a two-way street. So the material culture can be active in its relationships with humans as well as passive and so thus potentially influences the actions of humans as well as the reverse uh, from production to eventual deposition. The object biographic approach tends to focus on the processes involved concerning a specific object, so in this case Travisca ware. Uh, due to its uh, specificity, uh, stages in any object biography model can vary depending on the object itself, its provenance, its period, uh, obviously, but um, the principal stages tend to be, broadly speaking, creation, use and reuse and deposition. Uh, however, as Travisca ware is often highly decorated, I thought it was good, you know, it was prudent to include design as a stage. You can see I've kind of done a brief kind of uh, uh, thing on the screen so you can kind of see, see visually. Um, However, as Travisca wears often, oh, sorry, I read that bit. <laughs> um, it's also beneficial to use other contemporary objects in a comparative approach with the chosen material culture. As such, early Bronze Age beakers and food vessels were used as comparative tools against which observations made about the Travisca wear sample were discussed. Due to time constraints, obviously, you know, COVID, the thing that's kind of been, been in the news a lot, and it kind of been just a master's level thesis as opposed to a PhD. Um, it was not possible doing that um, microscopic observations on the data set, um, although, you know, it's certainly something I would like to do in the future. Um, 
So kind of therefore all of the first hand analysis was done macroscopically, but there were times when studies enacted by others such as Sobel's 2011 lipid analysis study could be incorporated into the discussions. And her study helped constitute a subchapter in the chapter on sort of use function, where it's important to define both terms. So the, uh, the differentiations used in the study were those taken from Henriksen and McDonald, 1983. Uh, use denotes the task the vessel is designed for, while function denotes the vessel's various roles within its cultural system. And obviously, it's very, very important to remember that both uses and functions of an object can change over time. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm not going to discuss all the results, There's, there was many, many, many things, but I am going to discuss just a cross section of the results from the study. And if anyone kind of wants to read more, I'm happy to send my thesis on later. Um, so from some interpretations were made directly from macroscopic observations of the Traviscoware and others by comparing the Traviscoware to early, other early Bronze Age ceramic types. Some discussions developed in dialogues with other relevant studies were also included. It was impossible, given the restricted time frame and issues relating to COVID, to kind of in that kind of any in-depth microscopic analyses, which I know I've said, but I just want to. <laughs> I didn't do any of the microscopic stuff. I just want to be very clear on that. Um, so fabrication, Traviscoware tended to have handles, but the beakers and food vessels did not. Traviscoware was usually made wholly from gabroic clay, whereas beakers and food vessels tended to be kind of gabroic admixtures. Uh, and I saw this macroscopically, and it was also written in the, their museum entries. Uh, the inclusions in Traviscoware were overwhelmingly white, which supports the idea that Traviscoware was made with pure gabroic clay, whose inclusions tend to be quartz or feldspar. Contrastingly, for the beakers and food vessels, many inclusions were black and some were red. This may suggest that these inclusions had been sourced from elsewhere, and this, uh, their entries also refer to them as being gabroic admixtures. The Lizard Peninsula in general contains many varying minerals. The minerals used in all three ceramic types um, could easily have been found, um, have been sourced from the, the lizard, but both quartz and more so feldspar in particular, um, they're often found in actually the, the, the gabroic clay deposits themselves, actually in the clay. And this was seen through consulting and comparing studies on the lizard's minerals to petrological analyses of several examples of Trafiscoware and by first-hand observations of the gabroic clay deposits along the coastline between Dean Point and Lowland Point. And it's important to remember that the data set was small and therefore it is necessary to extend it before any results could be considered more conclusive. Um, so design. Uh, there were varying designs across the data set in terms of decoration. Most were somewhat to highly decorated while 30% of the data set was undecorated. The vast majority of Travisqueware in the data set regularly utilized chevrons of some description and those that didn't were sherds. So, but that's not to say that other sherds from those vessels may have been decorated. I just didn't, they weren't recovered, so I couldn't tell you. Um, the uses of chevrons and Travisqueware is also noticeable in other collections, such as the collections at the British Museum. In contrast, the beakers and food vessels in the data set tended towards the use of dotted lines, raised lines, or notches instead. And I, I make the idea that perhaps these beakers and food vessels typically made using gabroic clay gabroic clay admixtures were decorated differently to differentiate them uh, typologically from the Traviscoware. Generally, Traviscoware in the data set was much more highly decorated than beakers and food vessels, which could suggest that this regional pottery type had regional importance and perhaps even had an elevated importance over other pottery types of the period. However, again, the data set would need to be widened to kind of support this conclusion more conclusively, this claim more conclusively. Uh, the decoration of Trafiscoware may therefore have been intrinsically linked to kind of a regional identity. So use and reuse. As propounded by the current state of knowledge on early Bronze Age Cornwall and Britain, uh, Trafiscoware was regularly used as burial urns. Trafiscoware may they therefore have represented regional identities of either the deceased, those burying them, or perhaps both, or neither. Um, the way in which a vessel is used may not reflect the potter's desired use uses, but in fact, may be a result of repurposing. And you know, kind of this is where the discussions on use versus function uh, come into play. Other studies on prehistoric ceramics all the way into the Roman period, and maybe further, but these studies weren't consulted, um, have found evidence of vessels being first used for cooking and later for cremated remains, including a Romano-British cooking pot utilizing Cornish gabroic clay. From the data set, there were Travisqueware vessels found containing or associated with cremated remains that also showed potential macroscopic traces of cooking. 
it was necessary to use lipid analysis to establish more conclusively if these macroscopic traces were in fact due to the vessel having been used for cooking or if the marks were caused during deposition. In lieu of personal research, Sobel's lipid study, which contained five vessels from my data set, made some interesting observations. Potential traces of cooking in the data set were not overly presented. This may suggest that early Bronze Age Travisca was more associated with funerary contexts, i.e. kind of ritual cooking and storage, rather than related to everyday cooking. Any slight traces of cooking may therefore represent more ceremonial reasons, such as milk for a feast. This idea was supported by Sobel's results for Travisca Ware, where the majority of her subset was derived from funerary context, in fact, all bar one. And while many of the vessels contained evidence of ruminant dairy fats and or ruminant adipose fats, they appeared to have had shorter use lives than other early Bronze Age ceramics in her study. If Travisca did have a comparatively short use life, then this may help to account for why many Travisca vessels are discovered in complete or near complete condition without significant de degradation. Some examples of Travisca have been found outside of Cornwall. Therefore, if Travisca represented a regional identity and as early Bronze Age Travisca appears overwhelmingly associated with funerary contexts, it may be that these vessels represented the identity of the owner, perhaps a woman from Cornwall who married elsewhere, um, or were used to display someone's regional identity at a faraway feast, or were simply a way for someone to honour their heritage and death, or a, a present gifted to someone, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, deposition. While beakers and food vessels in the data set were utilised as comparative tools, the readings on fine sites focused specifically on Travisca Ware. Among the data set and also with the surrounding literature, there appears to have been a penchant towards funerary depositional practices with Travisca Ware. Most of the sites where Travisca Ware examples from the early Bronze Age have been found tend towards barrow sites. Barrow sites, as suggested by Andy M. Jones, appear to have been repurposed through the ages, often beginning as sites of ceremonial importance in the Neolithic, many were found to have become places of burial during the Bronze Age, during 2005. While the majority of excavated barrow sites were discovered along the north coast, with a particular concentration around Newquay, this cannot be taken at face value due to an array of variables which, which dictate where archaeologists will dig. For example, Newquay is a particular hotspot for tourism, and constant new building mixed with coastal erosion increases the chance of archaeological discoveries there. However, Harlin Bay was a very big uh, Bronze Age cemetery, which was sort of near modern day town of Newquay. And so that probably was very um, prominent with trade links. Um, so while I think there were probably good reasons at the time for having um, a lot of sites there, you have to kind of take everything with a pinch of salt. Associated tools were found with all three ceramic types in the data set. They did not appear to discriminate between beakers and food vessels and were found with most of the complete or near complete Travisca vessels. There was also rather a variety of tools and materials used for the stone, flint and copper alloy. Travisca ware is often found associated with cremated human bone and much of the data set supported this. Between this and the literature, there seemed to, to be an elevated importance of Travisca ware in funerary practices, i.e. cremation of the early Bronze Age. One such a viscoware vessel found at Herlin Bay, for example, contained partial remains of at least seven individuals and also evidence of ruminant dairy fats. However, while cremated remains have been found with beakers, within beakers, food vessels and traviscoware, traviscoware has been found disposed of in an array of different ways, sometimes whole, sometimes near complete or ritual deposits of sherds, and in the data set almost equally with or without associated cremated bone. And it must be remembered that how ceramics are found are not necessarily accurately reflective of how they were deposited. Um, so obviously, you know, coastal erosion, for example, will definitely move things um, and that, that wasn't how they were deposited. While well, early Bronze Age Travisca ware, to my knowledge, has only so far been found at Barrow sites, there appears to be somewhat of a shift in depositional practices into the Middle Bronze Age, with Travisca ware being discovered also in domestic, content, con con domestic contexts, such as Trithelan Farm near Newquay. However, Trevelyan Farm may represent an anomaly. If Trevelyan Farm is indeed an anomaly, then it may even strengthen the argument that Travisca Ware's tight-knit relationship with funerary practices continues throughout the entire Bronze Age period. But again, more research into the Middle and Late Bronze Age depositional, pra depositional practices would be needed to further this theory. So, um, next slide, please, Brian. Um, so limitations of the data set uh, for the study. There were inevitably several, several factors which influenced the parameters of this study. First and foremost, the data set is relatively small, and so it would be necessary to extend it 
and if possible with the collaboration of other museums, not only the Royal Cornwall. And while it is unlikely some sherds or vessels in the collections at the Royal Cornwall Museum may have been mislabeled in terms of typology or their time period. Also, while some early Bronze Age collared urns exist, there were no samples usable in the current Royal Common Museum collections. And then in choosing the data set initially, all sites producing ceramics in the data set exclusively included only those excavated pre-2005, as Andy M. Jones's thesis on ceremonial landscapes was used to narrow down the list of excavated sites producing early Bronze Age ceramics. Again, because I knew I had limited time in Cornwall, uh, you know, because of COVID, because of the uh, time constraints. Jones sites were all barrow sites, and although Bronze Age Trafisca is overwhelmingly found on barrow sites deposited in funerary contexts, other sites were not explored in detail. There is inevitably a bias towards which areas get excavated over others, which could skew results. Similarly, there is survivorship bias with the artifacts themselves, including associated cremated bone and the copper alloy finds, etc. And uh, there might be that some clay matrices actually survive better in the soils of Cornwall than others, while evidence of storage is overwhelmingly ephemeral. The delineated geographical area study was restricted to the area between Camborne and the border with Devon to try and avoid making two generalised statements. You can kind of see kind of the edge there. Um, so, um, so this was to try and avoid making two generalised statements, especially considering the large concentration of sites in the Penwith area, uh, which produced many, many prehistoric ceramics. Um, and due to a lack of conformity in practices, the Isles of Scilly was also excluded. And due to time constraints, again, the data set is relatively small. And because the data set is relatively small, it includes as many kind of whole or almost whole vessels as I could, could include. And some finds from antiquarian discoveries were excluded because they were inadequately reported on. And this actually shrunk my data set considerably, um, which is a shame because a lot of these are antiquarian discoveries and they just haven't been written about. They've just sort of been dug up and shoved in the museum. So it's, a bit, it's been a bit of a shame, but unfortunately that that was how it was um, and Sabel's subset of Trevisca is also very small so its results cannot carry too heavy a weight finally as the uses and functions of ceramics may change over time this study focused solely on the early bronze age period but Trevisca existed before then and after then so interpretation from the study cannot necessarily be applied to the Trevisca of the late neolithic or the mid to late bronze age periods next slide please Brian are there any questions with regards to the data set or the sort of a research side of the project? Um, I have one, perhaps, perhaps it's better for the end. Um, is there any plans to broaden the data set at some point? There will be, and I will talk at the end of the uh, presentation about okay. where to go next, if that's all right. <laughs> Nigel? question uh, when you say that it um some of the pottery contained evidence of lipids and cook cooking is that as a, do you know if that's as a regular thing or was it a a one-off to go with the cremation um so from um feast in that thing well pot, um you know? from the lipid analysis study um, comparative to other early Bronze Age ceramics, it was found that there wasn't lots and lots of evidence of cooking. Um, there was only slight evidence of cooking, whereas, you know, some, some pots were very degraded. They had lots of evidence of roasting, lots of evidence of boiling lines, that kind of thing. Whereas the Trevisca ware, there was evidence that fats had been in it at some point or um, milk had been in it at some point, but there wasn't lots and lots of really um, easy to see traces of cooking, but there was in the other vessels. Um, so that sort of led me to believe, and, and Sabelle as well in her uh, thesis also kind of came to this conclusion, that although uh, Trevisca ware might have been used for storage or it might have been used for cooking, um, it wasn't used as kind of everyday, uh, all the time kind of cooking. Um, kind of special occasion, you know, like, um, your mum has that special bowl that she uses for salad and she sometimes uses it when you have your, your grandma around to visit, that, that sort of thing. So I, I think they were probably used for kind of more ceremonial uh, ritual things. So a feasting, yeah, best. Or, yeah. yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, anyone else have any more questions? Or if Nigel has another question. 
I, I have another I question. I'm, I'm still absorbing oh. things. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, the ones that were found, the Goa Broke pottery found outside of Cornwall, was there uh, was it the same sort of thing as stuff that you find in Cornwall? Um, so the evidence for uh, Triskler found outside of um, Cornwall were very, very similar. They were, um, I had a little look into them, Park, uh, Parker Pearson talks about them. Um, they were kind of the same as the Trevisca of Cornwall. They weren't Gabrook ad admixtures for the most part. Um, for the most part, they were Trevisca ware vessels, um, which would lead me to believe that they were actually made in Cornwall. And yeah. I know that Parker Pearson, he suggests the idea of clay um, moving uh, as a raw state, but I don't believe that. I mean, clay's heavy. I carried a load of it in a rucksack on my back and I wouldn't be carrying it crazy distances. Um, so I personally think that these Tarisque Ware vessels were made in Cornwall and they were perhaps gifted, like I said, at a faraway feast or uh, you get married and it's part of your dowry or, um, you know, it's part of your heritage. So you're like, this pot kind of represents Cornwall. So you, or, you know, that area of the world. Um, and so you kind of take it with you when you move or, yeah, you give it as a gift to someone because you think it's nice. Um, I'm not going to talk about it too much here, but in the thesis, I kind of talk about uh, the kind of ritual aspect of it. And it might be a case that people are kind of traveling to the lizard as a ritual thing every year or, you know, every two years or whatever to kind of gather the clay, make their pots. And it was a kind of a big cultural thing, like, um, I don't know, like the Frouda Day in St. Just every year, you know, it was kind of something people were doing kind of routinely. Um, and they've been, the most places they've been found are Dorset, Wiltshire and Padicale. So this would kind of suggest that maybe there's trade links involved, you know, maybe someone swapped the pot for, I don't know, some string. Um, but yeah, I, they are, they do, are, they are very, very similar to, or, you know, quote unquote, the same as the Travisca Ware vessels we get from Cornwall. Sorry, that was a really long answer. <laughs> it's no, it's fine. It's perfect. It's amazing. Um, any other questions before we move on? Yeah, sorry, Nige. Yeah. Go on, go on. Um, yeah, it's, it's a strange one, maybe. I don't know. I do ask strange questions. Um, the where that you found with the cremations, is there any difference in sort of the, probably the, the, the size of the barrow and everything else compared to the amount of design on the pottery are they more ornate um, that's what i'm on about you're on about uh, ritual and everything and yeah um so what i found from the decoration for the most part um Trevisca was a lot more highly decorated than the beakers and the food vessels and i kind of i didn't want to just say that about my data set i also looked at examples at other museums granted online um but i looked at other examples from other museums and that kind of seemed to be the general trend um and i think it personally I think it stems from a regional identity so any beakers that were made in Cornwall any food vessels that were made in Cornwall they were made but they weren't really um decorated overly because they were more kind of for everyday use yeah. whereas Trevisca Ware, because I believe it was more for ceremonial use um it, that Trevisca was reflected in the decoration yeah even within that Trevisca Ware, though do you think there was any correlation between higher um, higher society or anything with more ornate pieces? Um, well, I was hoping this. Um, I was hoping this. I looked at um, the cremated human bone and I did a lot of osteological training as well in the lead up to the thesis. And I was hoping that I might be able to find evidence of sex so I could tell if it was more males that were there, more females that were there. Um, if I could tell anything about um, if they had any health conditions, any diseases, anything like that, that could possibly help me with that question. That was a question I had myself. Um, but unfortunately, we find that um, cremated bone warps with the heat and it's very, very difficult. And obviously, it depends what survives. You know, if you do a cremation and you burn a body for long enough, you might only get a few pieces of bone left. And while I think I managed to sex, I think one female and one male, I'm pretty sure. Um, it wasn't enough evidence to be able to kind of push that idea too far. And I would be very hesitant to say that idea um, at the present time because my data set for the cremation remains just isn't big enough. Um, 
but um yeah i because i mean there's there's a urn um, in the I was going to say, there's an urn in the Royal Cornwall Museum from Ro Ro uh, Rose Cliston, which is a site just outside Newquay. Most of them seem to be around Newquay, to be honest. Um, and that was an old man with arthritis. And I wouldn't say that his, you know, this urn that he was found in, this vessel that he was found in, was more highly decorated than other Travisca ware. Um, but I mean, again, not everyone was necessarily cre uh, cremated and put in these pots. So it might be that it might be that you were only put in these Travisca ware vessels if you were of higher importance. But again, I don't have enough data to kind of conclusively answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Amazing. OK, uh, any I think someone else popped up with a question or are we OK to move on? No one else? OK, cool. Change the slide. Thank you. <laughs> OK, um, so the final chapter of the thesis focused on recreating Travisca ware style vessels for use in experiments. The experiential considers choices implemented and why in Travisca ware's production, as well as the necessary skills involved in achieving them. As the archaeology is limited, assumptions are made about ancient methodologies and tools used in a prehistoric society, and these are used or approximated wherever possible. And I want to say I shy away from using the term replica where I can, because for someone in the modern context, no matter the methodology employed, um, you will not be able to replicate a Bronze Age vessel exactly. Uh, and moreover, I made four vessels for use in the experiment. And while I tried my best to have uniformity between all four, um, you just don't get that um, because with when um, clay dries, you get shrinkage. So um, you know, depending on how much water or how humid it is that day, you know, there's all sorts of variables. You can never get anything exactly uh, replica. Um, and so I explain the five stages within the experiential section as briefly as I can. Um, so stage one, uh, we've got the sourcing of the clay. So a re research was enacted into places along the lizard where the gabroic clay could be easily sourced and two days were spent collecting the clay from colluvial and fluvial deposits along the coast and carrying it in hiking rucksacks along the footpath back to the car. Uh, and I'm not going to say where the location was exactly, but it was relatively close to Coverack. Um, and yeah, so that was obviously going down and collecting the clay and that was uh, quite a hard walk back up the very hilly footpath. Um, so stage two, processing the clay. It was estimated how much clay would be needed for the experiments and to be on the safe side, more was gathered than was necessary to allow for any mistakes or miscalculations. Around 33.5 kilograms was gathered and this was left to dry for a week or so because dry processing is often preferable to wet processing. The initial processing of the clay involved grinding it down into smaller particles with locally sourced Muller stones. When the clay could be passed through a 6.35 millimeter sieve, it was bagged and packed, ready to post to Dublin. And I had to uh, write quite a lot of customs forms. So uh, they were probably like, what's this girl doing? Um, <laughs> from here on, the rest of the actions involving the modern gabroic clay were undertaken at University College Dublin. At UCD, it underwent its secondary processing, where it was ground down even further until it could pass through a 0 0.5 millimeter sieve. Stage three, processing the inclusions. The inclusion elicited for use was determined by various literature sources on Travisca ware, as well as by macroscopic observations of examples from the data set in chapter two. While there have not been many petrological analyses on Travisca ware, those that have been enacted found feldspar to be the most common inclusion. As such, burnt feldspar was chosen for the inclusion because it has the same chemical composition, and, but once burnt, it's a lot easier to crush. Because um, as you can imagine, I'm doing all of this processing by hand. Um, sizing was again chosen in reference to the literature and from macroscopic observations. So it appeared that from while some Travisca ware had larger particle sizes like five millimetres, inclusions of this size were not common. The most common particle size for inclusions were two millimetres or less, and so the feldspar was crushed until it could pass through a two millimetre sieve. Stage four, making the vessels. The amount of inclusions used in the four vessels was determined by firing test tiles with different concentrations of inclusion in each. The most success successfully fired tiles contain inclusions at 35% of the overall volume. This seemed to agree with macroscopic observations of the vessels, and this was supported by several experimental archaeology projects using similar materials. An urn from Harlan Bay, 
1985.9, and it's in the display cabinet just as you go in the museum. Um, was used as the rough guide for the replica vessels, as it was relatively small, almost fully intact, and its composition corresponded with the agreed upon processed materials. Some measurements were altered slightly, but the ratios remained in the same proportions as the Harlem Bay urn, which had very steep sides. Hypotheses were made as to how the Trevisquare vessels may have been constructed, and this relied on observations made on the data set, which looked for evidence of joining lines, coils, etc. It also relied on the experiential, employing different methods of crafting to see which best suited the Gabroic clay. Although I would like to enact microscopic observations as well as macroscopic in the future to be more conclusive, it appears likely that Travisca vessels would have been crafted using a flat base to which flat sections would then be added in order to build up the sides as kind of seen in the photo at the bottom here. Um, this method complements the data set because we often see probable joining lines running horizontally at various points around the vessels um, and visible surface line interior cracking. Um, it would also account, and this would account for why the thicknesses of the walls of the Harlem Bay urn were relatively homogenous throughout. And this is something I notice about the sides of other Travisca ware vessels too, because if you if you make pots with the coils, the sides get thinner the further up you go. So I spent a long time measuring the thickness of sides of the pots at various points along the the sides, and they seemed relatively or exactly the same width all the way up. Um, and that this also accounts for the interior kind of cracking because I found from making the vessels, the it it's a very short clay, so it cracks quite easily. And while you can quite easily smooth the outside to kind of cover up any of this, you know, ugly cracks, um, you a don't really want to bother with the inside because that might compromise the stru structural integrity. Uh, and b I tried that on the first pot, and actually I ended up breaking it and having to start again. So um, that might account for why you can kind of see interior cracking on the archaeological vessels. Um, so stage five, actualistically firing the vessels. Now, actualistic is a term used in archaeology to describe how a prehistoric process was likely enacted. For example, the actualistic firing of the replica Travisca ware involved using a bonfire and firing the vessel within the flames on a relatively still dry day. By employing actualistic methods, it helps to further simulate the actions that may have been involved in the production of prehistoric objects and contributes further to the experiential aspect of the project. The experiential allows for, fir for real first-hand experience of what working with, the, the, with what working with heroic clay may have been like. And I have to say, I've never in my life worked with a clay that got me as frustrated as heroic clay, which leads me nicely back to the idea of repurposing. Gabroic clay, especially when inclusions are added, is so difficult to work with, it is not surprising that Travisquare vessels often appear to have been repurposed with diverse, with diverse uses and functions before deposition. So for example, you know, ceremonial or cooking and then used as urns. The Gabroic fabric is also very sturdy once fired, which may account for why so many vessels have survived either fully or relatively intact, even to the present day. This factor must be considered when comparing the amount of surviving physical wear to that of other prehistoric ceramics. It might just be that it just survived really well and it kind of, that's why we find more of it. Um, next slide, please, Warren. Okay, so um, experiment one, testing the percentage of overall volume for the inclusions. The experiments and their findings will be explained as briefly as possible, but for further thoughts and wider contextualization, please consult the study. Firstly, it was necessary to decide which percentage of overall volume would be used. This involved wider reading of other experimental ceramic projects which use felspar or similar materials as an inclusion, as well as notes made from the macroscopic observations. From the macroscopic observations, the inclusion content seemed to fall within the range of 20% to 50% of the overall volume of each complete or near complete vessel. From consulting other experimental projects, the optimum range for inclusion was found to fall between 20 and 40% of overall volume, with toughness increasing up to 50%, but strength decreasing thereafter. As such, 35% being within the optimum range and also corresponding to the data set was chosen as one of the test percentages. To, due to time constraints, it was decided to test only three percentages, and so the other two were decided by choosing a percentage that fell at the lower end of the optimum range. So in this case, I decided to choose 20% and one which was close to the higher end of the optimum range, but at the same interval away as the other two. So I had 20%, 35%, and 50%. 
six tiles were made. You can see this this middle photo here, and um, two of which two of each inclusion percentage, and these were made as homogeneously as possible. Three tiles. So I actually used a cookie cutter, so they had, were the same thickness um, and the same shape. Six tiles, uh, sorry, three tiles were actually holistically fired, while the other three were kiln fired to see the effects of kiln firing on the gabbroic fabric. The 35% tile was the easiest to work with, while the 20% tile was very plastic, and the 50% tile was prone to cracking. The actual holistic tiles were fired first, and the temperature and timings of the fire were used to inform the timings and temperature of the kiln firing, which was 800 degrees for 120 minutes. Uh, not that the fire was at 800 degrees the whole time, but that was the temperature it reached for the longest amount of time when it was at its peak. Um, all of the actualistically fired tiles resembled Travisqueware in the data set, and all of the tiles were success successfully low fired, which corresponds to Borlase's comment in the 1870s on the barely baked nature of Travisqueware. The, fires, the tiles were fired between 500 to 800 degrees, which infers that Travisqueware could be fired at relatively low temperatures and may explain why gabbroic clay was elicited for use. Ironically, three of the vessels were kiln fired alongside the three kiln tiles in order to save time as actualistic firing involves firing one vessel at a time using a considerable amount of fuel, time and relying heavily on the weather. But I really, really wish I'd had more time um, because you can see what, what happened to them. Um, so kilns, the true enemy of gabbroic clay. Um, initial observations showed that the tiles had slaked in the kiln. Uh, the cracking seemed to precipitate from the inclusions, which are turned black, likely due to the chemical reactions undergone during the kiln firing process. Unsurprisingly, the slaking continued across the entire sample until the tiles crumbled completely. Um, so as you can see from the uh, photos uh, where you see um, the comparison between the kiln fired vessels and the um, actualistically fired vessel, it just crumbled. Over a week, uh, those three vessels just turned to crumbs. And I, I did have a bit of a cry about it because they took so long to make. Uh, they don't look it, but they did. <laughs> um, so um, we were kind of trying to think of a reason for this. So I was discussing with some of my lecturers and we came to the conclusion that calcareous uh, clays some kind, sometimes called slaking. So we decided that the two 35% inclusion tiles the same inclusion as the replica vessels, we decided that they would be placed under a portable X-ray fluorescence reader. Um, but it was, so if the calcium content is more than 8%, you can, you can consider it um, with quite a high calcium content. Um, but it was found that the actualistic tile, uh, the average was 2.77% calcium, and the kiln-fired tile was 2.55% uh, uh, calcium. So therefore, the slaking had been caused by other reasons. As the slaking precipitated from the inclusions, they appeared to be the culprit. But after a lot of thought, it was established that the issue was not with the feldspar itself, because the actualistic firing had been fine, um, but rather the combination of feldspar mixed with the firing conditions of the kiln. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as we can see from the table, there are three crucial differences between actualistic firing and kiln firing. It was therefore hypothesized that the fourth and final vessel, if it were fired actualistically, would be fired successfully, re uh, reacting similarly to the tiles. And post-firing, it would resemble archaeological travisca wear, just as the actualistic tiles had done. So experiment two, fanning the flames, breaking the fourth wall, question mark. <laughs> the most important thing to remember with actualistic ceramic firing is that it is crucial to warm the vessel slowly as the most common cause of failure in pottery firing is spalling at the base. The vessel was examined post-firing against the criteria. It survived well and as predicted, reacted similarly to the tiles. It was light brown and low fired with sporadic patches. Um, sorry, um, Brian, can you go back a slide? You're, you're too quick, please. Sorry, thank you, I've just noticed. <laughs> Do you want me to change the slide? Yeah, can you go back, please? Um, oh, we're right, sorry. We're still on experiments, sorry. Thank you. Uh, 
the, <laughs> the other way. Sorry, you dropped out a second. I didn't I missed that. Oh, right. sorry. Cool. Um, the, so the most important thing to remember when with actualistic ceramic firing is that it is crucial to warm the vessel slowly, as the most common cause of failure in pottery firing is spalling at the base. The vessel was examined post firing against the criteria and it survived well and as predicted reacted similarly to the tiles. It was light brown and low fired with sporadic patches of red and black from oxidation and reduction and the inclusions were white or clear. These patches of red or black can also be seen on Travisca wear and probably stem from the variable conditions of outdoor firing. The actualistic low firing of the vessel suggested that gabroic clay from the lizard could be fired at temperatures reached in an average fire. It would be interesting to see how replica Travisca wear would fare during an actualistic firing with temperatures beyond 850 degrees, which is, I actually think the highest temperature the actualistic fire got to was 853. The kiln fired ceramics were red and the inclusions turned black, unlike the actualistic, actualistically fired vessel and the Travisca wear in the data set. Contrastingly to the kiln fired ceramics, the actualistically fired vessel showed no signs of cracking and it looked and felt like Travisca wear. So ironically, the vessel which had been made as a spare and almost didn't get made, turned out to play a starring role in the experiment section of the study. Next slide, please. Um, so reflections and limitations. post firing reflections. Gabroic clay is already a short clay as discovered through the jam jar test, which revealed that there was a noticeable percentage of silt within the clay matrix. Gabroic, gabro, gabro admixture vessels may therefore perhaps be a result of using levigated clay, but petrological analysis would be needed to dis or disprove or prove this. The addition of feldspar as an inclusion added to the shortness of the clay, probably accounting for the difficulty in working larger amounts of it. The less gabroic clay is worked with, the better, as this helps to avoid cracking. Experience agreed that there seems no good technological reason to add additional temper or clay to the lizard's gabroic clay, Williams 1985. It was therefore postulated that while technological properties as well as cultural likely played a role in why lizard gabroic clay was used, the inclusions were more likely to have been added for ritualistic and or cultural purposes. It is geologically possible that inclusions were sourced from the same area as the clay rather than the potter's location. Therefore, rogue, raw gabroic clay may not have traveled far as suggested by Parker Pearson, Pearson 1990. There may even be ideas of autochthony at play and that the lizard was a pilgrimage destination, perhaps visited annually to make pots in the spring months. If, ritual, if ritualism was a key player in the formation of ceremonial sites and the deposition of Trevisca ware, then there is no reason at all why its importance would not extend to production. It seems that this regional ceramic, uh, sorry, this regional ceramic was more than just a physical vessel for storing or cookage or cremation, cooking or cremation deposits, but a metaphorical vessel for Cornish early Bronze Age identity. For further discussions on the ritualistic and cultural importance of Trevisca ware, particularly concerning its production and deposition, please refer to the study as I really don't want to bore you to tears here, but there's a lot that's to be said for the ritual and cultural stuff. Um, so please give the thesis a read if you get a chance. Uh, limitations. There were other possibilities for inclusions to be used in the replica Trevisca ware, but it was not possible to it was not possible to pursue, pursue research into them all. Similarly, samples of gabroic clay could have been taken from more than one location, but time did not allow for this. Most petrographic work on Trevisca ware has focused on the origins of the clay itself, so more petrological analyses on the inclusions are required using more up-to-date techniques. Due to due to time constraints, it was also not possible to make lots of replica vessels. As three replica vessels were lost to the kiln, other planned follow-up experiments could not be enacted. Actualistic firing is variable, and the possible effects of this on the ceramics were acknowledged, but not explored in detail. And as much as I wanted to explore every avenue, it was physically impossible within the scope of a MUSC study enacted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. We're almost done, don't worry, there's only a couple slides left. Um, so we've reached our next question section. If there's any questions, please, regarding the experiments or uh, the more kind of scientific side of the study. Question? Again, sorry. No, it's gone. Oh. Um, actualistic, did you, do you think they sieved or did they pick the conclusions um, out? Um, inclusions, well... I, I would imagine that they probably just use the inclusions that were found in the gabroic clay sources, sources itself, like actually in the clay. Yeah. Um, but When you're actually sizing down, you know, you were reducing grinding and everything. Do you think there was 
just ground and then picked any bigger pieces out they didn't want. Yeah, so um, any uh, really big pieces that didn't kind of grind down very nicely, I just took them out with my hands and um, they probably would have done some sort of sieve using like muslin cloth. Um, right. But there was quite a lot of time constraints. And as you can imagine, there's like 30 of us fighting to do our thesis all at the same time. Um, so some of it is just a case of I had Mechanical. some, I had to cut corners some in some places, you know. Oh, that's fine. And the slabs, did you roll them? Pardon, sorry? Were the slabs rolled or slapped down? Or um, no. Um, so for the most part, I used my fist, um, but I did use the uh, rolling pin when I made the tiles because it was really important that the tiles were as uh, homogenous as possible with each other. Yeah. Okay. So I did use a rolling pin for the tiles. And very quickly, one last question. The spalling, did it separate from the, the base away from the uprights? Um, so actually, I didn't undergo any spalling. No spalling happened. Um, what happened in the kiln was slaking. Um, oh, okay. So Sorry. basically what happened is the inclusions didn't like the um, conditions of the kiln and it caused it to crack. And the cracks came from the inclusions and it basically okay. just all fell apart. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. No, no, no worries. Um, there's some things that have been coming through through the chat. Um, so Lisa Brown said, um, interesting, I'm coming around to the idea that inclusions are more about ritual uh, rather than necessity for firing. Um, oh, well, that's uh, great. I, uh, I achieved one of the things I tried to achieve. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so pleased I was able to connect from Canada. Um, oh, I suppose there's something for the end, but um, she said she would be interested in looking up your paper. So, but yeah, Perfect. leave that for the end. Yeah, I have um, one slide left apart from my thanks, but they cool. don't really count as a slide. <laughs> okay, so we can do more questions and stuff after that then. Yeah. Cool, brilliant. Okay. All right. Okay, perfect. Um, so where to go next? There are many avenues that could be pursued from here, all adding valuable discussions to the rich topic of Travisca Ware. I'm going to highlight some of my favourites in the hope that they will actually come to fruition one day. Um, so one, it would be interesting to enact, ex enact experiments on a range of replica gabroic or gabroic admixture vessels, exploring the usage of varying inclusion types and percentages, percentages, and to see how each vessel does in the firing process. As a follow-on idea, it would be interesting to test gabroic clay from different deposits along the Lizard Peninsula. There is quite a wide range of hypotheses that could be tested regarding the fabric of the replica vessels. It would be ben three, it would be beneficial to further explore potential technological motivations for using this gabroic clay, such as thermal shock resistance. The original plan for the thesis was to explore the thermal shock resistance of gabroic clay, and this is something that I'm pursuing this year. Four. It would also be prudent doing that thermal conductivity tests on replica Travisca ware, which is another avenue I plan to explore this year. It would be interesting to, uh, five, it would be interesting to enact cooking experiments on replica Travisca ware, such as roasting and boiling, and to compare the marks left behind on these experimental ceramics to marks observed on the archaeological Travisca ware. Six, it would make sense to widen the data set as the data set used in the study was relatively small. The Travisca West subset using Sabel's lipid analysis study was even more small. So if possible, it'd be amazing to enact lipid analysis on more Travisca Ware, and if possible, on complete or near complete vessels, as these were omitted from Sabel's study, which only tested shirts. Seven, in terms of microscopic studies, it would also be prudent to petrologi petrologically examine more instances of Travisca Ware, as the current data set is fairly limited, and to analyze ceramics from across the Bronze Age in its entirety in the hope of identifying continuity and change in the fabric. Eight, in a similar vein, it would be interesting from a paleogeographical perspective to identify and map gabroic clay deposits in Britain and the projected movement of these gabbro outcrops over time, perhaps even trying to attribute specific vessels as clay to specific deposits on the lizard. Nine, using radiocarbon dating to more conclusively date the Bronze Age, particularly ceremonial sites in Cornwall, would be beneficial as this would further study, as would further study into the locations of these sites and why materials utilised in their constructions and why, such as the idea of uh, cosmography, perhaps, and ultimately what was deposited at these sites and in what way ways. Uh, 10, a semiotic study looking into the extensive usage of chevrons as decoration and their symbolism, perhaps with comparisons to other cultures. 
And finally, as suggested by Jones in 2005, there is great value in enacting the further material culture studies involving other early Bronze Age artifacts from Cornwall, perhaps even looking at artifacts from the wider Bronze Age period. An object biography of Middle Bronze Age Trevisca ware, for example, is something I would like to do in the future. Material culture studies such as these would complement each other well and make a solid contribution to regional syntheses and in turn more general narratives. And my final remarks. When it comes to history pre-written records, there is no way for findings of any research or experimental project to be 100% accurate or conclusive. And the shortcomings which are inevitable to any methodology must be acknowledged, addressed, to be eliminated wherever possible and accepted. Moreover, regional studies such as this one while geographically limited in scope, do constitute vital threads in the overall tapestry of Bronze Age Britain. And without these regional syntheses, larger scale top down approach studies cannot be enacted as successfully as possible, just as regional studies cannot be contextualized without referring to the wider literature. Therefore, the importance of enacting interdisciplinary studies and the dyna dynamism, reciprocity and benefits in doing so must never be underestimated. Ultimately, what Travisco seemed to represent is the apex at which materiality, technology and culture collide. And I cannot wait to further explore the rich plethora of subtopics that this area of study has to offer. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we can go to the final slide. Um, yeah, any final questions? So plans to, so earlier I mentioned like plans to incorporate a broader sample size into the already existing data set that you have. Um, is there a possibility you could, I don't know, you should somehow, or do you need, is there, I don't know. Uh, you, like, you should in what sense, to widen the, the kind of data set and the research or in terms of experiments? Uh, the data set and the research. Well, I mean, I did use sherds in the data set. Um, okay. So I, I used a mix. I did have sherds as well. I wanted to make sure that I, I, I basically included any near or near complete vessels that I could that had adequate literature, but I also made sure to include sherds. So I did have sherds in my data set as well. Cool. All right. Um, anyway, by the way, I'll just say this again. Um, because a few people have joined halfway through. Um, this is being recorded, so if you're not comfortable having your voice on, uh, you can either fly something through the chat or um, we can wait until uh, we could stop recording in a bit and then if anyone wants to ask a question after that, we can do it then. Um, any other questions? Oh, yeah. Um, no. uh, a couple of quick questions. Uh, from a kind of a broader abstract point of view, um, how did you find, Laura, the kind of, as well as when you were undergoing your project, kind of from the start, beginning and towards the end, um, the relationship between, uh, it was kind of something you discussed throughout the part of your project, but kind of the relationship between looking at the object biography of um, the where versus doing the actual kind of experimental side of things. Um, and was, was there anything that kind of came up that you were surprised with? Was there, was there anything ah. that came up that was kind of clashing with just kind of any kind of interesting kind of things that you noticed or didn't expect or anything kind of weird or strange that came up? Generally, um, a lot of what I predicted did come up. Um, I suppose the biggest thing that was the biggest sh kind of shock for me is I just assumed that Gabroic clay was being used because it was a kind of regional identity thing and I assumed it'd be easy to work with because why would you choose a clay to work with that's horrible to work with you know um so that was a shock I found that yeah I was really surprised at that um and again it's the same thing for the inclusions I assumed the inclusions had been added for kind of more technological reasons. Um, but actually now I'm more thinking it's maybe to do with a dichotomy of light and dark and perhaps, you know, uh, death and life, um, sort of the darkness of the clay with the lightness of the inclusions. Interesting, yeah, very cool. Uh, and one final quick question there. Do you have any of your of, of, of this particular kind of posture yourself, whether right to your own personal heritage or things you've picked up down the line or? 
<laughs> no, I don't own any oh, Trubisky okay. wear. No, that's, that's, that's <laughs> um, very fair. That's very because just... I know people pick up things. And... <laughs> no, um, I I had to give it all in, but I have dug okay. a lot of Trubisky wear in Cornwall. Um, but yeah, all of it has been recorded and given to museums. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. No worries. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. Yes. Arthur, go on. <laughs> um, how do you? I mean, what is it that makes you so sure that it is? Um, you know, I mean, it's cardos, pasties, and pesties. How do you know they're not just using what they had to hand? And it wasn't, you know, I mean, it's got quite a low firing point, I'm told, and has a nice green colour. How do you know they weren't just using what they had around, as opposed to it having a, like a real significant spiritual and you know tied into the landscape? Uh, used for that, for it. Um, so when I collected the clay first hand it was extremely heavy and it was kind of hard to get to and I just don't believe that they would have traveled uh, they would have used clay um, and kind of spread it around without there kind of being a reason for it um, so for example like there's clay deposits all over Cornwall um, from clay that's easier to work with and looks nicer nice. than gabroic clay um, so why wouldn't they use other local clays? Why would they use gabroic clay, you know? So kind of the experiments side of it was to kind of look at different technological reasons. And I'm basically trying to work my way through a list of techno technological reasons for using it and kind of trying to cross it off with pencil. Obviously you can't ever cross things off with pen, but cross things off the list as I go um, as to why perhaps it was used. I hope that answered your question. Absolutely. Very cool. <laughs> so you didn't think that it was uh, because they were it was local clay and the, the potter that lived in, you know, the area or the potters that lived in the area just used that clay because it was the easiest to obtain for them, the cheapest to obtain? Um, well, see, the there's actually Cornwall and and. Um, you know, people might not necessarily know this, but Cornwall's actually relatively big. And when you think about, you know, we're thinking of a time before cars, we're thinking of a time where, you know, people right. are, prob are probably going to be walking. You don't want to be carrying things for too, too long right. distances, you know? You know, 25 um, pounds of clay is heavy carrying it from my uh, workbench to the hug mill. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's still heavy there. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. And this was something I realized, carrying it on my back, I was carrying, I don't know, like, 12 kilograms or something and I was just like wow my poor back you know um so yeah I I really would find it personally unrealistic that they would be uh carrying it long distances so there must have been right. some other reason for using it you know or you um, had... oh sorry I'm I just that was going to be another question that's all right I thought you were wrapping up I know I was just going to say and I also think that probably things the pots themselves were actually made at the lizard um, because again right i think moving raw clay would be quite difficult and Unless even though they moved it by river yeah yeah they did field studies um especially in the 1980s and they were walking around trying to find evidence of production centers and they couldn't find any but i mean if you're just going with your say your mom or your sister or whatever and you're making pots and you're only making like one per person um right. there's no reason to expect production centers, you know? Right. You know, the, the whole reason I think that like the beaker culture they, they're ta they've talked about has spread so much is because somebody in this village went, visited somebody in another village that had that pot and said, hey, I like that. I like the design. I can make that myself at my village. Yeah, and, and that's and oh, sorry. Just that, you know, and and that's kind of you know not word of mouth, but we're you know by line of sight, I guess you would call it. Oh no, and I think that's that's definitely possible. Um, a, another thing I mentioned in the thesis on, in regards to the kind of cultural stuff is that anyone could make a pot with gabroic clay. Like the methodology I used is really simple, um, right. and I truly believe that it's probably been that you know maybe people were making this in their families people that weren't necessarily trained potters you know um right. it, it it could be made by anyone well most pottery with enough practice can be made by anyone yes no but what, what i mean I is 
Yeah. No, no. Well, I mean, you know, look, you start out as a kid, as a little baby watching your mom making pinch pots and she gives you a wad of clay and you make pinch pots. And I've taught kids how to make pinch pots and that, you know, when they get to the third grade, these are like uh, five and six year olds. When they get to the third grade, they're pretty much making Neolithic looking really good pots because they know what smooth is and they know what, um, you know, yeah. what well, can I mean, to make, well, you know. Well, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, if it's a re if, it's, if it's a ritual space and people are perhaps traveling to it every year to source clay from the lizard, um, right. you know, it might be that, you know, children are being brought up with their parents to see this, these pots being made and they do sort of learn how to make them from a young age and then you know that might explain the more wonky ones we find perhaps right right because because what mom doesn't want to get rid of the wonky pot that your kid made because look what I made for you mom whether it's you know now or back in the you know stone age um, what mom I, doesn't you know would ever give up that pot I was going to say, I don't want to run over time too much, so I would encourage you to read the thesis itself where I discuss all of this stuff in the thesis. Um, I just didn't Sorry, want to talk about it. To... And, and oh, no, that's awesome. okay. Um, I, you might have missed the big at the beginning. I kind of said I wasn't really going to talk about ritual and cultural stuff in the presentation, but I do oh. talk about it in the thesis. Um, so if you want the thesis after, I'm, I'm happy to send it to you. Just send me an email and I'll send it back to you. Thank you. No worries. Um, yeah, so I suppose we can move into that. Um... Would, in terms of sharing the thing, how, how what's the best way to contact you? Um, uh, well, or um, contact you, or how, how do you want to share it? How do you want to share the... Um, I suppose if you put the last slide back up of the presentation, mm. it has all my contact details on there. And if anyone wants it, um, if they jot down my email address, either of them, I, I look at both pretty much every day, um, email me and I will send it across. But it okay. is also in, um, it should be in the Crescent Kernow databases as well. So if you go into Crescent Kernow, you should find it on their online database as well. Thank you very much for coming here, Laura. Thank you, everyone else. It's been a very good um, time learning about Kabok pottery. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to stop recording now. Well, thank you very much for having oh. me. Yes, yes.